Okay, so you've spent you know, 100 million dollars, you've built something, so you just launch it, right? Yeah, and this is again, one of those costs and practicality things that we don't think about. Not only do you not want to do that, but in fact, usually the rocket company won't even allow you to go on it how you have you not done certain testing. And this is purely for safety reasons, legal reasons, policy reasons. And there's not just one test that you have to do. You actually have to test for all of those physical things that we were talking about earlier. So there's a lot of, we've talked about the temperature effects in space. There's huge swings because you're outside the atmosphere and that's changing it. Well, if you've ever lived in a cold place, uh, going, living in uh, Indiana outside Chicago where we'd have minus 20 and minus 30 winters, electronics sometimes start to stop working at minus 20 and minus 30 degrees Celsius. Likewise, if you've ever left out your phone in the sun and then all of a sudden you get that heat warning, it says, oh, your phone's too hot, let it cool down. Electronics are designed to work at certain temperature ranges. But how do you deal with that in space? Yep. Um so here we have the um, space testing facility at Mount Stromlo Observatory, and this is a giant vacuum chamber. Yeah. So they will make sure that it works in a vacuum. That's right. And they can also presumably hit it with radiation to make sure that it doesn't heat up or cool down, or maintains its temperature correctly. Because maintaining temperature in space is hard. It's very hard. You've got heat coming in from the sun, which might disappear when you go in the Earth's shadow, and you've got heat radiating out, you've got to balance them all. Uh, you can use heaters, but not too much, your en energy will cut out. Exactly, and this is, and because of your orbits, and depending where you are, if you're going around low Earth orbit every 90 minutes or 100 minutes, that means these temperature variations are happening every 50 minutes. If you're a geosynchronous orbit, it's a little bit less. But if you're having a swing from, say, minus 100 degrees Celsius, which you get it to, to 150 degrees, if you're right in front of the sun and reflection of the Earth, your electronics now have to work over two to 300 degrees Celsius, which is a really big ask. So not only do you have had to design it and make sure it'll work in that, but you need to test that it will work in it. Because if you send that satellite up and, oh, the cold killed it, that's it. And this is a big difference between most terrestrial equipment. I mean, in terrestrial equipment, you can often have a try it and see what works. Yeah. So you can put something in, oh, that didn't work, try something else, oh, that didn't work. Again, keep playing with it until it works. Like in a typical physics lab, yeah. you'll often spend a lot of time trying different things out. In space, you get kind of one shot. That's it's right. launched, and it either works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you can't sort of switch a fuse over or add a bit more oil or something like this. Exactly. So all of your testing and all of your scenarios of what could go wrong have to be tested ahead of time because if your $3 million that you just spent to go up and you said, oh, we shortcutted the $50,000 to test it, not only will you get yelled at, but now you have a $3 million piece of space junk. And so temperature and vacuum is a big one. Uh, something that people don't think about is vibrations. Now, we've seen videos of rocket launches. They're really powerful shaking things. The astronauts are shaking, they go through testing. Well, well your satellite is as well. And surprisingly, one of the things, again, that we test at Mount Stromlo is this giant table we call a shaker table because it's a table that shakes, simulates essentially a rocket launch. It says how much force is going to go on this satellite. Is a cable going to come loose? Is that wire going to come loose? Again, if you don't know about it before it goes up in space and it happens on the rocket launch, well, you can't really fix it when it's up there. And surprisingly, something like 30% to 40% of satellites have something that goes wrong on the first go in their shaking table vibration testing. And you can't avoid going on the rocket. That's it. So these are the sort of subtle things that you may not think about. How strong your receiver is, right? We, we will explore a little bit in this course uh, communication in space. Well, how do I know I can actually talk to my satellite? If it's going to send a strong enough signal that you can pick it up from whatever ground station you're using and vice versa, that it's got good enough receivers to pick up the signal you're going to send from your ground station. No use having an Earth observation satellite that can't send any of its observations back to you. It might have the best pictures in the world. It's not much use. Exactly. So you can't really just say, all right, this satellite seems to be having a powerful enough receiver. You actually have to put it in a isolated, essentially radio quiet room so you can physically measure the exact strength that the electronics is putting at. So I know, oh, if I get to 550 kilometers, I can no longer download my data. It must be below 500 kilometers. And 
electronics have different sensitivities, and we know this, right? As cameras and mobile phones improve, how strong the network is, how far we can talk to, that all changes. No different for a satellite as well, but the difference here is you need to know exactly where it is, otherwise you can no longer download your precious data. Something we also don't think about is dust. Now, when we think about dust, we're not talking about necessarily uh, dust polluting space. We're actually talking about dust polluting the environment the crafts are building, right, Paul? Yes, yeah, so when you build any piece of really precision equipment, any dust that comes in, most of the dust around us is just flaked off bits of skin. If one of that's sitting on your detector, all you're going to see is skin and not distant galaxy. Exactly. And, and electronics in particular are very, very vulnerable to bits of a hair or a, a fragment of something landing on your silicon chip could easily short circuit something and cause it not to work. That's right. So these things have to be built in high class clean rooms uh, which have filtration systems designed to keep any dust from getting away and people working in these things wear the masks to stop any skin flaking off and the hairs coming out. They have to put on special shoes and they come in their special sticky pads yep. when you walk in to make sure that any dust on your feet are not carried in. The air is filtered through and there are different categories of this. So, That's right. Um, uh, it depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do microelectronic fabrication, then you need to be a very high category clean room. Other things like assembling the solar cells might not need quite such a high category. And, and this is the sort of thing, is in here, in fact, they're, detect they're assembling a little camera that's going to go in one of these satellites. And so, yes, it's kind of simple. You can solve it, but that means you need to pay the people to do this. You need to pay for all this equipment. You need to pay for the room to run. You need to pay to make sure it's a room that's clean enough. And these things just don't exist, right? It's not that to say, I'm gonna go clean my bedroom really well and go test this thing. You need special equipment and all this stuff just takes time and money. And these are the sort of things that we don't necessarily think about when that satellite's going up is all this work that has to go in so that satellite does exactly what it's going to do when it's in space.